am so happy to be here today at the UX Right On Festival. <laughs> Danny, has anyone ever made that joke before? Yeah. Okay, I thought so. Sorry. Back to our regularly scheduled programming. Um, I'm so happy to be here with you all today. It's so nice to be doing this in person again. Um, let's take a moment and again thank Danny and Annie Marie and the whole team for putting this together. Um, it's really been lovely. So uh, here's my gratuitous fancy slide. I've worked with companies and written books. And in the course of working with companies and writing books, I do a lot of talks like this, uh, usually not in places this nice. But uh, you know, the basement of a hotel on a Thursday morning can be a lovely place. <laughs> and in the course of giving these talks, people tend to ask me a lot of questions. At least I hope people ask me a lot of questions. I like it when people ask me a lot of questions. And of late, I've started to notice a pattern in these questions. Regardless of where I am, what the conference is, who the audience is, there seems to be a pattern in these questions. So let me walk you through some of the questions I get asked. And let's see if this observant room full of UX and product professionals can spot the pattern. So when I speak at UX conferences like this, the first question I usually get asked is, how do we get product managers to value user research? We do all this amazing work. We have the insights that could change the company. And we go to product managers. And they say, yeah, make it actionable. I have shit to do. How do we get them to be different? Meanwhile, Several weeks later, across town, I'm at the product manager conference. And the product managers are saying, how do we get user researchers to prioritize the work we actually need? Like, we have deadlines to hit. I need information on the thing that we're building. And they're like, well, we did research on some other stuff that you're not supposed to deliver in two weeks. And it's like, that's nice. So there does tend to be this little bit of the two Spider-Mans pointing at each other <laughs> in UX and product that I think Kate spoke to really eloquently earlier. Um, as Jana spoke to earlier, I promised Jana that if I referred to her on stage, I would get her name wrong. So as our good friend Janie Barstool said earlier today, um, if you work in an even remotely sales-oriented or agency model style company, how do we get sales to stop promising things we can't deliver? Right? They sold this thing, and then we have to go build it. How do we get them to stop doing that? And at nearly every company, especially those in the middle of those five-year transformations that Jonathan just talked about, how do we get executives to stop handing us lists of things to build? So again, you may have noticed a theme in these, in these uh, very different questions. But all of these different questions happen to have the exact same answer. And if you've been reading the footer of this talk, <laughs> you might know what that answer is. You don't get anyone to do anything. I can tell from that silence that some of you don't like that answer. So I'm going to make you say it along with me. Say it along with me. One, two, three. You don't get anyone to do anything. People in the back. You don't get anyone to do anything. People in the front. I hope you do better than people in the back. <laughs> you don't get anyone to do anything. You don't get anyone to do anything. OK, so I first spoke these words to a similarly uncertain audience at the last Agile conference I spoke at, where after giving a talk, you know, the floor was open to questions. There was one question. And that question was, how do we get executives to understand what Agile really means? And I thought about it for a second. And I said, you know, I don't think you get anyone to do anything. And the reaction from the crowd was, again, underwhelming, to say the least. People were like, oh, excuse me, Mr. Not Helpful. You don't get anyone to do anything. Great overgeneralized dismissive answer that doesn't actually help me, but I promise it does help you. Once you recognize that you cannot get anyone to do anything, it is the path to freedom. And to explain this, I will turn, as I often do, to Alan Watts, noted cat daddy and fantastic Buddhist philosopher, who said, when we attempt to exercise power or control over someone else, we cannot avoid giving that person the very same power or control over us. I want you to take a moment and really think about that one. 
When we attempt to have power or control over somebody else, we are giving them power or control over us. So you might be thinking, oh, if only that product manager understood my work, then I could really make a difference at this company. If only those executives stopped giving us lists of features to build, we could really be empowered to do great work. But it's not actually about that product manager or that executive. Folks, the call is coming from inside the house. You are making the choice to give up your power to these other people. And just as certainly, you can make the choice to ask different questions. So let's do that together. Let's look at some of these questions. Let's start with this one because this is probably the one I get asked the most. How do we get executives to stop handing us lists of things to build? Or how do we get executives to understand what empowered teams are all about? Or how do we get executives to really let us do our best possible work in this fast changing world that we live in? When I'm presented with a how do we get question, the first thing I try to do is reframe it as a how do we help question. Because helping is something you can do. You can help. Rather than setting yourself in opposition to somebody else, rather than trying to control them, you can seek to understand them. And for those of us who are UX and product people, we are often uniquely well positioned to help understand the trade-offs that will help executives achieve their goals. We just have to draw an upside down pentagram and summon a product manager to help <laughs> us make these trade-offs. So if you're given If you're given a list of things to do by an executive, there's a pretty fair chance that they don't know why they're giving you this list. <laughs> I think I assumed earlier in my career that every executive had some well-formed set of goals and strategy that they were keeping from me. Like they don't trust me to know the secret plan. That's why they're giving me this list of features that doesn't make any sense. Someday I'll get into the room and find out what the secret plan is. Folks, I got into the room, there is no secret plan. <laughs> there is no secret plan, just a bunch of people who don't really know what they're doing, same as us, trying to figure out how to not go out of business. So one thing you can do is help people understand what their goals are. And part of how you can do that is by helping to prioritize and rank things. So if you're given a list of 10 things to build, rather than saying, yes, boss, or no, we don't have a strategy. She's like, cool, which of these do you think is most important and why? And if you go, well, they're all important. Okay, just humor me here. If you were to put these in order, which is the most important, which is the least important? In a lot of cases, we don't really know what our goals are until we have a choice to make. As evidence of that, see me trying to pick out what to order on Deliveroo nearly every night. I might have grand like, oh, I'm gonna go home and like eat all this food. It's gonna be awesome. And then I start looking, I'm like, uh, half hour later, I'm still like, uh, and I'm like, this is too hard. I'm just gonna eat the leftover oatmeal I have in the refrigerator. <laughs> I've learned something about my goals. My goal was just to eat a food. I didn't actually care which food it was. For executives who give you lists of things to do, this is often the case as well. They're used to giving people things to do and people doing those things. So they are like, I must be doing a good job. When you actually force them to make a choice, you learn a lot about what they care about. The best product people never say yes or no. And I think this is really important because those of us who have worked with product managers have probably suffered for them saying no and for them saying yes, right? We've gone to them with a good idea and heard them say no. And we're like, mm, fine, asshole. <laughs> or they've gone, hey, the boss asked us to stay for three weeks all night and finish this thing. And I said yes, and you've gone, great, asshole. <laughs> saying yes or no are both reactive things, right? They're single dimensional reactive positions. Somebody comes to me with something and either I say yes or no, but I don't dig in any deeper. There's no new understanding created. There's nothing generative happening. And it's that reactive defensive position that often results in us giving away our power to other people. We have a tendency to construct narratives where the people asking us things are all powerful villains and we are powerless victims. I've been amazed at how many times in my career somebody's come to me and been like, go build this thing. And I've been like, 
I don't know, maybe. Here's what we prioritize. Do you think this is actually more important to help us achieve our goals? And they've been like, oh, actually, I don't care that much, bye. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I was ready to like fight you for, to, for the honor of my team and be like, my team has prioritized this work. And, you and they're like, no, I don't really care. I just had an idea, and I like having ideas. If you don't say yes or no, you're in a generative space, not a reactive space. More interesting things happen when we're in a generative space. It is often in this generative space as well that we realize that the people who we think are like these all-powerful, uh, monstrous figures are just like they don't really know what they're doing. They're insecure, and they're reactive, and they're defensive, and they're trying to do their best the same as we are. So if we don't engage them in that defensive and reactive way, we get to see them as who they are, which can be really mind-blowing sometimes. So one of my challenges to you as you go back into the world, I often advise product people to do this. In the morning, if you wake up really worried about one person, if you're like, oh, so-and-so is going to see the work I'm doing, they're going to have all kinds of opinions, they're going to be an asshole about it, I'm going to hate it, reach out to them. Shoot them a message and say, hey, I'd love to walk you through some of the things we're, we're deciding on and see what you think about these trade-offs. Set the tone for the conversation before they give you something to react to, and you will almost certainly be surprised at what you get back. In my experience, the most surprising thing I've often found is that that meeting where I thought they were out to get me or I thought they were really mad about work I was doing, they were just thinking of something else. Can't tell you how long. Hey, I think it's really important we talk about this. Somebody's been like, look, I'm really busy. I've got this other thing going on. I don't care. And I'm like, oh, did I make this about me again? Oops, turns out it's a totally different thing and nobody actually thinks about me or cares about me that much, which is good. <laughs> it's the path to freedom, folks. For those of you who are UX people, you are particularly well equipped to do this because UX people can often reframe these conversations not just about what you want versus what I want, but about what's better for our users, what's better for the world. When UX folks have enlisted me in these conversations, they've asked me questions like, which of these options do you think would help our users the most? Or one of my favorite little sneaky questions, which of these do you think will get us closest to achieving our vision for a better world? Oh, we have a vision for a better world. Which of these things should we build? Let's lay off half our staff and get rid of all the uh, content moderation. <laughs> Timely joke. <laughs> so let's go to these questions, the two Spider-Man's questions. Because really, well, first of all, all the things we just said about executives also true of product managers, even though they are not mini CEOs. If I hear that one, I, I, I've like mostly stopped hearing like, product managers are mini CEOs. Um, so, judge duty eye roll at that one. But regardless of that, these two questions are, are, in a sense, really the same question when we get to the heart of them, right? What we're really trying to figure out is how do we work together to achieve our goals? That's really the question here, right? If we get to how do we get product managers to value user research, presumably, we want them to value user research because that user research, we believe, will help us achieve our goals making the world better, helping our users, living up to our UX and product strategies that work so nicely together. Similarly, for product managers, they want the research that will help them achieve their goals, which might be slightly different goals. They might say, look, we need to ship this in two weeks because we've made commitments. We need to deliver on these commitments in order to move past them. Now, the funny thing is, I've been called into a lot of conversations with companies to navigate this question. But I think many of them have focused on the wrong part of it. There's a lot of this emphasis on how do we work together? What should our role clarity be? What frameworks and systems should we use? Who has decision rights on our team? In my experience, most of these questions of role clarity are actually best resolved by goal clarity. I was gonna put a goal, but I was like, if I pick a football team and it's the wrong one, I'm gonna, it's bad. I just moved here, folks. Um, doing the best I can. <laughs> but it's been really interesting, right? I'll sit in on a team's retrospective where they're like, we need decision rights. We need to know who can make decisions on this team. Is it the UX person who decides or the product manager who decides? And I'm like, all right, what's the last decision you made? And they go, well, we don't really make decisions <laughs> because we don't know what we're trying to do, so we can't decide how to do it. And I'm like, okay, cool. 
maybe the problem here is not that you don't have hypothetical decision rights, but rather that you don't know what success looks like. You don't know what you're trying to do. We've created all these fiddly models for like, here's the 97 steps for autonomous teams, which is kind of funny to me, but the reality is high-performing cross-functional teams will self-organize around shared goals. And you can think about this, I use a lot of food metaphors, I am hungry, always, including now. Um, <laughs> if you get your friends together to cook dinner and you have a recipe, you're gonna figure out how to make the recipe. Right? It's not gonna be like, well my job description says I only chop potatoes, and your job description says that you can't use a knife, so like, you can't chop the potatoes, like, who cares? <laughs> a room of well-intended generalists can do a lot of great things together, if they know what they're trying to accomplish. And I see this also on teams, I'm not gonna talk too much about Agile, I hate talking about Agile, I'm so sick of talking about Agile, but when teams are like, we have a product owner and a product manager, we must be a bad team that sucks. I'm like, I don't know, man, like, talk to each other. Figure out what to do. A good group of people, if you know what you're trying to do together, can figure out what to do. I've worked with teams where like, there's a product owner and a product manager and they sit down and they're like, what are we trying to achieve? How do we do it together? If you know what you're trying to achieve, you can figure out how to do it together. If you don't know what you're trying to achieve, all you can do is have these useless, fiddly conversations about role descriptions and decision rights and other things that are probably not real things. The problem, again, is that many teams don't actually know what their goals are, and they certainly don't know what their goals are at a high enough altitude to naturally coalesce around them. So this is something I've been thinking about a lot and working with a lot of teams on. We can map out our goals on two axes, on high altitude to low altitude and high specificity to low specificity. And it's interesting to see where a lot of teams have goals set and where they don't. So a lot of teams I work with have high altitude, low specificity goals. The fluffy mission statements. We're going to be the best product in our product space and deliver value to all the people to whom the value shall be delivered. <laughs> Great. Get a team together and say, go do that. And they're like, uh, what's, our, what's our role clarity? What's the difference between these two jobs? Similarly, a lot of teams are really comfortable having high specificity, low altitude goals. So like, we're gonna increase the engagement rate on this one little tiny part of the product by a small amount, which doesn't really help coalesce because again, that tends to get people at odds with each other. When those goals are so low altitude that each person kind of has conflicting incremental, incremental goals, it's really hard for a team to coalesce. Um, there's also our low altitude, low specificity goals. Like as a user, I want to use the product. It's like, sure, let's not worry about that too much. <laughs> but what's interesting to me is these high altitude, high specificity goals. This is what I see. I was working with a team a while ago that was responsible for the high altitude, low specificity goal of onboarding new users to this platform. And I said, great, how many by when? And they were like, oh. And I kept pushing and they were like, well, we don't know. I was like, all right. Again, remember, optionality. I said, 10, 100, or 1,000 by the end of Q1. And somebody said, gosh, if we did 1,000, we'd have to like not do anything else and really focus on this. So we committed to 1,000. And we had a company leader on this call who said, I support you in this goal. I want you to come to me. If there's something that changes, if there's another trade-off you have to make, talk to me. But I support you reaching this 1,000 user goal. When I'm working with earlier stage companies, I often use this technique, which is building on Adam Thomas's survival metrics, which I highly recommend you check out. Take a photo of this and then go Google it or check out the slides because uh, this concept of survival metrics is so valuable and so mind-blowing. I'll sit down with them and say, all right, what are the specific high specificity, high altitude goals we need to hit before we raise our next round to feel like we got this? What are the goals where we're like, we can skate through it, we're not gonna go out of business? And what's the best worst case scenario? What are the highest specific numbers we could have where we still go out of business? And in the course of facilitating these sessions, those red light numbers tend to get higher. 
they're like, well, I mean, if we had 20,000 monthly recurring revenue, we still probably wouldn't be able to raise. So like, I'm like, all right, what if you had 25? They're like, oh, we still probably wouldn't be able to raise. So I go through this exercise with the founding team, with investors if they're willing to participate, and I bring it back to the product managers and UX people, and they say, oh, that's cool, we're headed right towards the red one. Nobody told us what we actually had to accomplish. They said, go team, do great, awesome work. Whatever you do is probably fine. <laughs> Nobody ever told us that there was a real existential challenge here. These high altitude, high specificity goals really help us work together. Now aligning your team around high specificity, high altitude goals requires deliberate and thoughtful facilitation. It's not easy to do. You can't just march out there and be like, all right team, what are our goals? And they're like, oh, no one ever asked us that before. It takes work. Now the good news, I know, right? <laughs> uh, UX folks are often really, really good facilitators. Like on cross-functional teams, I will often go to the UX person and be like, hey, can you show me the best way to facilitate with this team? Not the best way to facilitate, because every team is different. But UX folks who are human-centered, who know how to do this, you're all just watching the kittens, aren't you? It's really cute. Um, UX folks who are experienced in doing this understand that different humans on different teams benefit from different facilitation styles. And it's those people who will tell me, all right, we have some neurodivergent folks on this team, so we're going to want to make sure we give everybody time. Or we're going to want to make sure that we can do things this way and we don't rush things. The UX folks are generally the people I can depend upon to have the most thoughtful and empathetic view into how to facilitate for a team. That said, I put the kittens here to get you primed for this next thing, because this is really tough but really true, and I, I don't think it could go unacknowledged. Uh, facilitation is undervalued because it is often fem-coded. Uh, Sayel De Silva made this point at Mind the Product in London, and I'm so glad she did, because this is something that is implicitly true, but we don't say it out loud in a lot of cases. We don't value facilitative work in enough organizations. We value visionary work. We value, like, I've got a plan, and we're going to do it. But the folks who are the thoughtful facilitators are not often considered the heroic folks on their team. And there's a lot of reasons for this, which I think are really messed up, which tie into a lot of gender bias and a lot of other forms of bias, um, which I think we as a community need to work really, really hard to fight. So if your takeaway from this is like, great, how do we get product managers to facilitate a conversation about uh, high altitude, high specificity goals? No. Remember, you don't get anyone to do anything. You can begin initiating this conversation and you can do it in subtle, lightweight ways. You don't need to have a session with a Miro board. Not everything has to be a Miro board. I love UX people, but when I'm like, oh, you want to meet for coffee? And they're like, great, here's a Miro board. I'm like, no. No. So if we want to ask this how do we help question? How do we help our team understand and articulate our high altitude, high specificity goals? We can start by just asking folks on our team what they're working towards and why. Hey, what are you working on and why? Doesn't have to be a big formal facilitated session. We can do prioritization and stack ranking exercises as a friendly thought experiment. We don't have to make it a whole big thing. We can just say, humor me here. Which of these do you think is the most important? Again, doesn't have to be a big fancy facilitated thing. Finally, we can invite folks into our work. This is often the impasse I find myself at with UX folks, especially UX researchers. They're like, product managers don't value research. And I'm like, have you invited them into your research? And they're like, no, because they'll ruin it. I'm like, OK. <laughs> so what do you do? It's like, we go do the research ourselves, then we make a big deck that we hate, and we send it to product managers, and we talk about how much we hate them because they don't love it. And I'm like, OK. Sounds cool. Sounds really awesome. I'm really lucky because uh, one of my business partners in the States, Trisha Wong, is an incredible ethnographic researcher. And she taught me how to do user research. And she taught me how to do user research by letting me do bad user research. 
All of you who are good user researchers were once bad user researchers, and you forget this. You get so worried, you're like, what if product managers do all the things that I did when I started doing this? They're gonna, but that's okay. If they understand and you understand the goals you're working towards, there's actually not a ton of risk here. You can work with them. You can course correct. You can be curious. And you can be patient. I think one of the most damaging things about this, if only so-and-so would do such and such thinking, is that it creates a sense of urgency where there might not be a sense of urgency. There have been times when I've showed up to work like, okay, this meeting is happening, and if this person does this thing in this meeting, then like everything sucks, and I hate them, and I hate this company, and I hate my life. It's like, that's usually not how these things work. I've also been in the situation of going from being the person saying, if only product leaders did this, to being the product leader. And being on the receiving end of that, where people are like, why aren't you doing these things? If only you did this, everything would be perfect forever. <laughs> and it wouldn't. It wouldn't. I've tried. Believe me, I've tried to be the person who's like, I will solve all your problems in one ill-considered fell swoop. And it does not make things better. So to summarize, saying or thinking that if only so-and-so would do such and such means we are living in an ego-driven fantasy. Even if it feels like we are obliterating our own egos, we are actually centering our own egos, right? Because we're thinking about ourselves. We're like, oh, this person's out to get me. This person doesn't understand the things that I understand. And maybe more importantly, we're giving up all the power that we have. We're giving our power to these people. And again, we are doing it by choice. So I want to end on this note. The power is yours. You have more power than you think. And you can cultivate that power by seeking to help, by seeking to understand, by seeking to align people around common goals. Once you give up on this idea that you have to somehow solve the riddle of someone else's brain, this work gets so much easier. It gets easier, it gets more impactful. I sleep better than I used to. Again, the power is yours, the choice is yours. When I say you don't get anyone to do anything, it is not me being discouraging. It's not me saying you are powerless, it is me saying that you are more powerful than you know. Thank you. Thank uh you. -huh.